Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Kelly, for setting up. Uh, this is a great crowd. We're going to talk a lot of politics today, and it's essentially going to be uh, in three sections. I think a great way to introduce what I'm going to talk about is to first talk a little bit about my nonprofit, the Environmental Voter Project, how we got started and why we got started. And the second thing I'm going to talk about is how big data has completely revolutionized politics. That's important for people who care about the environment, and I'll get into why, but also just as people who are civically engaged and care about politics and might be paying attention to a pretty important election right now, it's important to realize that elections four years ago, six years ago, especially eight years ago, are ancient history. Ancient history with the way that campaigns and nonprofits target particular voters. And I'm going to get into that. And it's going to be you know, a pretty sort of wonky academic discussion about how modern campaigns, a very sort of Orwellian approach of finding the right people. The third thing I'll discuss is for environmentalists, but also for people in general, the latest studies on how to get someone to vote. If you think about political messaging, there's essentially two types of messaging. The one we're usually used to thinking about is persuasion messaging. How do I persuade Sarah not to vote for candidate X, but for candidate Y? I'm not going to talk about that. Instead, I'm going to talk about the other type of messaging, which is once you've found someone, how do you get them out the door? Because we've got a big environmental turnout problem in the United States. And so I'm going to talk about the Environmental Voter Project, talk about how modern campaigns use big data to identify voters, and then the latest behavioral science on how we get them out the door. And then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. So I'll start with the Environmental Voter Project is a nonpartisan nonprofit. And all we do is try to address the environmental voter turnout problem. We use data analytics to identify environmentalists who don't vote, and then we apply the latest behavioral science to get them to vote. And it started like this. I had been working on political campaigns, big and small, from president down to city council for over a decade. And there's something that always made me want to put my head through a wall. And it's something that many of you might be aware of, if not painfully aware of. And that's this. When you poll likely voters, in any election, any election, whether it's president or Medford City Council or something in between, and you ask those voters to list the issues they care most about, climate change or other environmental issues are nowhere, nowhere. They are almost always at the bottom or really close to the bottom. And that has a huge impact on how policy is made. Because if voters don't care about a particular set of issues, why on earth would we expect politicians to care about those issues? This just happens to be a poll that we put in the field uh, just a few weeks ago, or maybe about a month ago now, of people who are likely to vote in the upcoming presidential election. We asked them to list their most important political issue and then their second most important political issue. Climate change and the environment. Only, bless you, only one out of 50, one out of 50 likely voters listed it as their number one most important issue. And then another 2% listed it as their number two issue. So only 4% list it as a number one or number two priority. Now listen, I know that everybody cares about different things. And that's great. I care about lots of different issues, too. But, I mean, climate change is a uniquely existential crisis. And we're about to head into a presidential election. And the people who are probably going to vote have it all the way down here on their list of priorities. That has a huge impact on how campaigns are run, and on how policy is made. Believe me, every single candidate I've ever worked for 
really deeply cares about the environment. But the first decision any campaign makes is this. They decide, who are we going to talk to and who are we not going to talk to? They figure out who is likely to vote in their election, and then they only talk to those people. Which shouldn't surprise us, right? I mean, we don't, we don't expect Starbucks to care about us if we don't drink coffee, right? Why would we expect politicians to care about the opinions of non-voters? They care about the opinions of people who vote. Campaigns have limited time and money. Yes, money is a problem in modern politics. Absolutely. It hugely distorts it. But the amount of money that the Clinton and Trump campaigns have compared to Nike or Apple or all of these corporations that are trying to compete for your attention is nothing, is nothing. And they have limited time. Nike has forever to convince you to buy their product. Maybe not forever, but they've got a pretty long time. All campaigns care about is one thing, and that's getting 50% plus one of the votes for their candidate on one day. One day. Right now we're, what, 47 days away from Election Day. With limited time and limited money, campaigns can really only afford to talk to very, very likely voters. So what does that mean? Because they only target likely voters, they only poll likely voters to see which issues they care about. And if you don't vote, imagine how important your opinions are to a politician or a policymaker. They are not important at all. Again, to use a market analogy, we don't expect Toyota to market cars to three-year-olds. Three-year-olds can't drive. Why would politicians care about the opinions and priorities of people who don't vote? And this is bad news for the environment. Because remember that poll, and that poll is like every other poll out there. You ask likely voters to prioritize the issues they care most about. Climate change and the environment are way, way down there. Even when we elect the right people, Ed Markey, great environmentalists from, I think he's from Med, no, he's from Malden, so almost, almost here. Even when we elect great environmentalists, it's really hard to expect them to stick their head, their necks out and spend all their political capital on something that voters don't care about. So this is really important. But, but, even though we have this problem, I realized something extraordinary, and this led to the founding of the Environmental Voter Project. I realized through doing a lot of research for friends of mine who were pollsters after a, well, the last campaign that I got off of was actually, oddly enough, against that guy, <laughs> uh, Marty Walsh. I was running the opponent's mayoral campaign. Hey, Marty. Uh, I realized something extraordinary. The reason so few voters prioritize environmental issues is not because too few Americans prioritize environmental issues. I'll say that again because it's really important. The reason so few voters prioritize environmental issues is not because too few Americans care about environmental issues. It's because environmentalists are awful voters. They're disproportionately awful voters. There are actually tens of millions of people who don't just care about climate change, or other environmental issues. They list it as one of their top priorities. But the problem is they don't vote. And so they don't show up in those likely voter polls. Sometimes they show up in other polls of American adults, but politicians don't care that much about the opinions of American adults. They care about the opinions of voters. And to give you an idea of the types of numbers we found, We identified by name and street address, and I'll get into how we even know them by name and street address, 15.78 million super dyed in the wool environmentalists who didn't vote in the 2014 midterm. There were only, I think, 83 million people who voted in the 2014 midterm. 
yet there were almost 16 million environmentalists who are registered to vote but sat out. There were 10.1 million super environmentalists who didn't vote in the 2012 presidential election. And what's exciting is that we now live in a moment in time where data analytics and some pretty exciting computing power allows us to find these people. We can find people according to the issues they care about most. And we know whether they vote or not. And then we can apply a lot of new behavioral science research to get them to vote. Now, before I move on from this map, it just uh, I'll say one caveat. It's, it's prettier than it is useful. It, you, you might notice it largely just tracks where people live. Obviously, environmentalists have to be people, and so if you're a non-voting environmentalist, you tend to live where people live. But one thing that you might not see in a map like this is actually they're not, they're not all in the blue states. There's actually an enormous number in Missouri, an enormous number in Florida, Arizona, New Mexico, Maine, Georgia, we might open our second office in Georgia in a few months just because there are so many non-voting environmentalists there. A little bit closer to home. In Massachusetts, in the 2014 midterm election, which was also a gubernatorial election here in Massachusetts, 277,250 super environmentalists who are registered to vote did not vote. That was an election decided by 40,000 votes. On top of that, we've identified 98,000 super environmentalists who are eligible to vote, but not yet registered, which is why it's important to register to vote. Way to go, Jumbo Vote. <laughs> and again, and I'll, I'll get into this in a, in a bit, we know these people by name and street address. We can find them. It's a little scary, but it's something that everybody who cares about politics and everybody who's just a member of modern society needs to understand, because these are the tools that modern political campaigns now use. Uh, just to finish up one little thing about what we do. So that's all we do at the Environmental Voter Project. We don't endorse candidates. Because remember, once you care about a particular candidate winning, you don't want to talk to non-voters. All we care about is sort of the long-term game. We care about trying to address this environmental voter turnout problem. So we don't talk to good voters. We don't. We also don't try to persuade anybody to care about the environment. There are great groups that talk to good voters. There are great groups already out there that try to persuade people to care more about the environment, and God bless them. All we do is we use these data analytics to find environmentalists, people who are already persuaded, but don't vote. And then we use proven behavioral science techniques that I'll get into to get them to vote. And we've had amazing results. I don't need to get into them. But what I'm going to come back to a few times today, because it's very important, I don't want anybody to get discouraged by these big numbers. A lot of times people say, oh my gosh, almost 16 million environmentalists don't vote, and here we've got this awful climate crisis, and it, it can be very deflating. It's actually outstanding news. And I'll tell you why it's outstanding news. Persuading someone who doesn't care about climate change to start caring about it is really hard. And it's really expensive. Changing minds is hard. It's really hard. But finding someone who's already persuaded, who's already with you, and just trying to tweak their habits a bit so that they vote every now and then, I won't claim that's easy, but it's a hell of a lot easier and a hell of a lot cheaper. And so we have a silent environmental majority right now. We do. We have a silent environmental majority in the United States, and what's great is we have the ways to find them, and it's getting easier and easier to turn the non-voters into voters. And so this is good news. This is like showing up to a basketball game and realizing all of your best players are just sitting there in the stands, and if you put uniforms on them, you'll win the game. I mean, we, we know where our people are. 
and we just need to get them to do something that only takes about 20 minutes once or twice every year. That's really good news. Now, let's get into the nitty-gritty of not just how we, but how modern political campaigns use big data analytics to identify people who care about particular issues. And let's start with the revolution. I mean, four years ago, the data operation made up almost 40% of the Obama campaign's headquarters staff. This has completely revolutionized politics. I said something the other day at a panel, and someone giggle. I may as well say it again. You probably won't giggle. But like, uh, big data has killed the soccer mom. Do people remember the soccer mom like eight years ago, 12 years ago? It was a way that people had to say, okay, we're going to come up with a cute name for the demographic that is going to swing the election. People in the John Kerry campaign in 2004 realized, oh, okay, well, uh, suburban middle-aged women are really persuadable, and a lot of them haven't made up their minds. And so we're just going to do sort of a shorthand and call them all soccer moms, and th that's the key. That is ancient history. Ancient history. Now, now campaigns individually target you by name and street address. And it all starts with the voter file. Uh, if there's one thing that you remember from today, I want it to be this. Who you vote for is secret, but whether you vote or not is public information. Everybody got that? Whether you vote or not is public information. Public information. And believe me, every campaign under the sun starts by looking at that public information to figure out who they're going to target or not. Well, up until about six or eight years ago, voter files didn't have that much additional information on them. You could go to town hall here in Medford and maybe find out uh, someone's age, street address, party affiliation, gender, not much else. It's useful information, but not much else. Starting about five or six years ago, two companies on the liberal side of politics and one company on the conservative side started buying up tons and tons of consumer data. Things that you all know get sold and traded all the time, like whenever you buy something at Abercrombie & Fitch, you know that they like, immediately sell your name to 10 other people, right? Well, all that data is out there and lots of people buy it. Well, these companies bought all that data and appended it to the voter file so that I not only knew your party affiliation and age and street address, but I knew what magazines you subscribed to, what car you just bought. Now, there are lots of privacy controls in place, but yes, your reaction was accurate. Like, it's very Orwellian. Like, it's, it's crazy. Uh, it's the same stuff that actually for-profit companies have traded in for 15, 20 years. But now we have the computing power to do some pretty amazing things with it. Some pretty amazing things with it. And what campaigns do with it is called building predictive models. I'm going to go through this really quickly because I want to leave time for questions and answers. But, uh, but hopefully I'll be able to explain it properly. Uh, a predictive modeling survey is kind of like the inverse of a poll. In a typical poll, you would ask five or 600 people about 40 questions, and the information you get back could only tell you how really broad demographic groups feel about the questions you just asked. A predictive modeling survey is the inverse of that. They ask one or two questions of like 20,000 people, 30,000 people, 40,000 people. And I'll give you an example of the questions we ask. We ask 40,000 people, and not just any 40,000, but 40,000 off one of these data-rich voter files. We say, hey, what is your number one most important political priority? What's your number two most important political priority? Let's say 1,000, 2,000 people out of 40,000 
say, oh, climate change or clean air or environmental justice or something having to do with an environmental issue. It is then the easiest thing in the world for data scientists to look at all the hidden patterns and correlations in those 2,000 people who said, oh yeah, climate change is my number one issue. They can see, oh gosh, you know, there, there are a lot of people in this group who uh, shop at Brooks Brothers who are like yuppies in their late 30s who live near Boston. Or, you know, if you are an aging hippie living in the Berkshires who bought a Volvo 12 years ago and have two kids and are a registered Democrat, they, wow, you really care about climate change. And it's, it's kind of the same stuff that like insurance companies use to build actuarial models, right? Many of you probably haven't had to buy life insurance yet, but you're, you're familiar with the types of questions they ask, like, do you smoke? Do you dive off cliffs? Do you do things like that? They're trying to figure out behavioral patterns that help them understand, well, okay, how expensive is this policy that I'm about to sell going to be? Well, these predictive models are the same way. And do we poll all 300, 300 million people in the United States to find out who cares about climate? No. We poll a huge number of people, but because there is all this data appended to all of those people, we can now build what is known as a predictive model. A model that helps us predict which people are really, really likely to care about climate change. And so we've done that. In Massachusetts, we built a model tied to the voter file. So the, this is a file that has six million individual records, including all of you, on it. And we can assign a score from zero to 100, telling us how likely each person is to not just care about climate change, but list it as, num as their number one or number two issue. And we've tested this and retested it and retested it, and it is frighteningly accurate. How do we test it? We get all the people who score really high on the model, and we call them up and we say, hey, what's your number one most important issue? Oh, climate change? Yeah, we thought so. And then we call someone else, and then we call someone else. And 89% of our respondents said that climate change or another environmental issue was their number one or number two issue. To give you some context on how accurate that is, when you work on a campaign and you call up a voter to see if they support your candidate, so you call someone up and you say, hey, uh, are you going to vote for Hillary Clinton in the upcoming election? And someone says, yes, I will. You write it down. Studies have shown that that's really only about like accurate 80 to 85% of the time. So these models are actually more accurate than calling someone up, asking them the question, and then writing down their answer. They're more accurate than that because people lie. <laughs> this is more accurate than that. And it's not like we have some special sauce. This is what campaigns are using to identify people, not just who care about particular issues, but they can build models to help them predict who is likely to support a particular candidate, or who is likely to be undecided, but still persuadable, which as you can imagine is extraordinarily valuable. If I work for the Hillary Clinton campaign and you have already made up your mind that you're supporting me, but you haven't made up your mind and you're still persuadable, maybe I shouldn't be spending lots of money on you. Maybe I should be spending lots of money on you instead. And these models are extraordinarily powerful and accurate. And again, remember, they identify individuals. As some of you might remember, at the end of last calendar year, I think it was in December, something happened where the, the Democratic side voter file called NGP Van had a glitch in it. And for a few hours, people on the Sanders campaign had access to the Clinton campaign's data. Does anybody remember this? Yeah. What they had access to was this stuff, scored voter files. Clinton campaign has a bunch of predictive models that helped tell them, oh, these are people who are really likely to support Bernie Sanders and will never change their mind. So why bother talking to them? These are people who are really likely to support Hillary Clinton already. And so we actually don't need to spend lots of money on them. Ooh, but this, these are the people in our sweet spot. They're undecided and they're persuadable. And by the way, the Sanders campaign had the same things. Ted Cruz had an amazing 
set of predictive models and a great data operation. It's like this on both sides. So it's important to realize, not only because people who care about the environment have to deal with this turnout problem that I mentioned, but it's important to realize as modern American citizens that this is how political campaigns are run now. This is how they are run. To bring us back a little bit closer to the environment, this is some of the interesting stuff we found when we were able to identify not just people who care about climate change or the environment, but people who listed as one of their top priorities. Now, I want to be clear. No single data point is predictive in and of itself. Obviously, everybody's different. But here are some things that really helped us identify if someone was highly likely to care about climate change and environmental issues. Some of them are no-brainers, right? Oh, okay, if we have data saying that you're a forestry employee, yeah, you probably care about the environment. This one is really interesting and extraordinarily powerful in almost every state we've worked in. If you live in a home that no longer has a landline, there is a really, really high correlation to you, not just caring about climate change, but listing as a top issue. And that has nothing to do with age. We see that throughout all age groups. If you're in your 60s and you've ditched your landline, there is a very high likelihood that you really, really care about climate change. I don't know why. We don't need to know why. Maybe it has to do with embracing new technology. I mean, I, I have no idea why. It doesn't matter why. It helps us really find these environmentalists. And when we go back and test these models and test them, they are extraordinarily accurate. Other things, man, don't, don't believe the stereotypes. It's no longer young, wealthy, white people who care all about climate change and the environment. If you're a Latino grandmother living in Phoenix, you are just as likely to care about climate change as a hipster in Portland. In fact, if there's a, demographic groups are actually very unhelpful in helping us identify environmentalists, but to the extent they, they pop a little bit, Latinos tend to really care about climate change much more than most other ethnic groups. Uh, age, as well. Uh, we see something that looks kind of like a sine wave with two humps where actually people the age of most of you students, late teens, early 20s, might care about climate change, but they don't always list it as one of their top issues. When you get into your late 20s, early 30s, really, really important, or a higher number of people listed as being very important. Then it goes down, then we see what we call kind of a grandmother effect, especially among women in their late 50s and 60s it increases in importance again. Other really interesting things, uh, basketball fans tend to care more about climate change than baseball, football, or hockey fans. I, I don't know why. Uh, Catholic, you know, I, we haven't been doing this long enough to know whether this is a Pope Francis effect or not. Maybe it's been like this for five or 10 years, I don't know. But that is also a data point that helps us identify these folks. Um, so it's important to realize that this is not just how we, as a nonprofit, identify super environmentalists, and it is super accurate, far more accurate than just looking at the data and going with your gut, by the way. It's far more accurate than, like, if I found out you just bought an electric vehicle, like, maybe you care about the environment. I don't know. Maybe you bought it because, like, they're really cool or someone gave it to you. Like, I, I don't know. This is the most accurate way that campaigns have to identify voters. And everybody's doing it. Right now, as we speak, presidential campaigns are fine-tuning their predictive models every day, and they are targeting people with messages depending on those models. No one reaches out to broad demographic groups anymore. You hear about someone targeting the youth vote or targeting the this vote, that's only because no one wants to spend two hours talking to a journalist and then writing the most boring like, article ever about how they're actually targeting people. Like, they are targeting individuals. Individuals. Now, the last thing. How do we get non-voting environmentalists to vote? 
And how are political campaigns getting people to vote? And again, I want to be clear. This isn't persuasion messaging. This isn't how are they messaging to you to persuade you to not vote for that person, but to vote for that person. It's how are they messaging to you because they're not sure whether you're going to vote and they just want to get you out the door. It has to do with a real sea change in behavioral science that started about 10 or 15 years ago. Up until about 10 or 15 years ago, people assumed that the decision to vote was essentially a logical decision that people came to after doing a cost-benefit analysis. It was something that academics called rational choice theory, which went a little something like this. Citizens will vote if the value they get out of voting is greater than the cost of voting. That's a very, like, logical decision-making process. And the value of voting is whatever expected benefit you get from your favorite candidate winning, but you obviously have to discount it by the probability of your vote affecting the outcome. Now, what's the problem with that? This. Your vote is never, ever going to affect the outcome of an election. Like, come on, we all like, know that deep down, right? I mean, politicians, I mean, political scientists love to say this. It's hard to read a paper on voter turnout without hearing the following thing. You have a higher likelihood of getting hit by a bus on the way to your polling place as you do with your one vote being the vote that decides that election. So why do people vote? Like, whether we've actually gone through this analysis ourselves, it's interesting to think about if, if our one vote will almost never be the determinant, the one determining vote in an election, then we could never actually get more out of the transaction that we put into it, right? Well, what a lot of behavioral scientists have realized is that's because this isn't a rational choice. You're not making a rational choice. You're making what behavioral scientists call an expressive choice. And whether we want to admit it to ourselves or not, it's why most of us vote, and it's why most of us do a lot of things. We've decided that the act of voting is important to who we are. Maybe you've built a personality for yourself where you want to be civically engaged. Maybe you have spent all of the last three months talking to your friends about how important the election is, and so you want to go out and vote so they don't find out that you didn't vote. Uh, maybe you found all of your friends are voting, and due to some peer pressure, you want to fit into that. But it has to do with what is called expressive choice theory. And I'll give you some examples based on experiments. But remember, this means that we don't want to ever create a rational choice context for voter turnout messaging. These are a lot of messages you will hear, but they all have to do with persuading you to vote for a particular candidate. Studies have shown that they do not increase your likelihood of voting one iota. And so you know what we never do with the environmental voter projects? We never talk about the environment. We never talk about the environment because it never, ever, ever gets someone to vote. Ever. Ever. Instead, we talk about who you are and who you want to be, and these sound like really sort of like warm, fuzzy things, but they are anything but. We like totally dial up peer pressure and social pressure. Instead of saying low turnout, it's a close election, we talk about high turnout. We talk about who you are as a person. There are some, one of my favorite experiments ever, and I, I lived this 12 years ago on the Kerry campaign is this. And this was the best voter turnout theory of the time. We would call someone up. I'm going to pretend that Sarah's a citizen and she's a voter. I'd call up Sarah and I'd say, Sarah, turnout's going to be low in Ohio and it's going to be really, really close. So you've got to vote on Tuesday because your vote's going to make a difference. Now that is mathematically accurate, right? If you think of it as a fraction, if the overall turnout in an election is low, then yes, Sarah's one vote 
in the numerator has a higher likelihood of making a difference. That message has been proven in tons of experiments to depress turnout 2%. If instead you flip the script and you say, Sarah, everybody's voting on Tuesday. Everybody on your street, everybody in your neighborhood, they're all voting, turnout's going through the roof, you've got to vote. Well, it is mathematically accurate that now Sarah's vote has a lower likelihood of making a difference. Yet that message increases turnout 1.5%. If you don't think 1.5% is a big deal in this business, you haven't been paying attention to politics. Like, ask Al Gore how big a deal 1.5% is. It is everything in this business. Why? Because peer pressure works. And it works a hell of a lot better than rational arguments about the importance of voting. Some other examples, and then I'll really quickly finish up because I want to get to, to questions and answers. Uh, you don't try to have a rational choice context. You don't say it's important to vote because, oh, this thing that you care about or the candidate you care about will lead to the following outcome. Because, no, that gets into that rational choice theory equation thing where deep down, whether we want to admit it or not, like that, that's not an effective way to mobilize someone. You want to talk about being a good voter. I love these buttons. I am a voter. I am a voter. It's about who you are, not what you're going to do or what you might get out of the process. Whether that's how you view voting or not, it's proven to dramatically increase turnout. I'm going to very quickly give you some examples, just to finish up, of some stuff that we did at the Environmental Voter Project in an election right around here. It was a really sleepy state senate election, a special state senate election in parts of Boston, Cambridge, Winthrop, and Revere, just this past spring. And you'll see some of the things we're talking about. Uh, this was a like Facebook ad that, by the way, if you, if you really want to get into Orwellian stuff, we knew that we we're sending this, these to the actual individuals on our model. We can now target people with digital campaigns as individuals. <laughs> and yes, it's very scary. Uh, hey, Boston Revere, be a good voter on April 12th. We didn't talk about the environment. We didn't even talk about like candidates or anything. Who you vote for is private. Whether you vote is public record. This is really powerful. There's an experiment done by a guy named Hal Malkow, you can never say it, M-A-L-C-H-O-W, at University of Michigan or Michigan State like seven or eight years ago, where he did the following. He sent letters to a whole bunch of people that said, hey, I just wanted to remind you that who you vote for is secret, but whether you vote or not is public information. I've included a copy of your voting record below. I'm going to follow up after the election and send updated voting records to you and all of your neighbors. I hope you remember to vote on the 12th. Have a nice day. <laughs> People went nuts, right? <laughs> like they went totally nuts. And they called up radio stations. They called up Michigan or Michigan State, whichever one it was. And, and you know, clearly he did not end up doing this because uh, people came down on him. But did the voters know that he wasn't going to send these follow-up letters? No. The letters increased turnout 14.1%. Guys, you never leave high school. Like, peer pressure works. Social pressure works. And it's because the act of voting is a way to express yourself. And so, we do stuff like that. Your neighbors are voting on April 12th, will you? We did this. Don't worry, we didn't follow up with people like sharing voter voting histories, but we said, we're writing to remind you of an upcoming election. Who you vote for is private. Whether you vote or not is a matter of public record. Here is your public voting record. Then we went a step further. We said, based on our analysis in previous election records, we think 29 voters on your street are going to vote. Social pressure, peer pressure, high turnout, join your neighbors. We're going to follow up with you after the election to ask about your experience at the polls. Does it say the environment anywhere? 
No, it doesn't say the environment anywhere. We ran a large randomized control experiment. This boosted turnout, 6.7%. We only spent, I think, like 61 cents per letter. This is not just how we are getting environmentalists who don't vote to vote. It's how political campaigns are going to be getting people to vote. Messages just like this, letters like this, were sent out to the Iowa caucus people who they didn't think were likely to vote, both by the Ted Cruz campaign and also by Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton folks. They were using a lot of this, sort of these latest behavioral science techniques. Now, I just want to finish by saying two things, because it is very, very important to me that you don't take the wrong lesson out of this. One, the fact that so few environmentalists vote is good news. What would have been bad news is if I said, hey, we did tons of research and we found out that no one cares about climate change, which kind of sucks because we all know that it's going to change life as we know it. No, like that's not what we found at all. There are actually tens of millions of people who are already persuaded, and that's the hard part. Now we just need to get them to vote, which actually, as you found, it's, it's increasingly easy to find these people as individuals and dramatically increase their likelihood of voting. The second thing I want to say, and I want to close with this, remember, your, whether you vote or not is public information. And that shouldn't scare you. I'm not saying that to be like spooky and Orwellian. It means that your vote actually matters so much more than you think. So much more. It matters so much more than you think. Because regardless of who wins, regardless of who wins, every time you vote, that is like a bright red beacon on your public voter file that tells every politician, whoever runs for office where you live, this is a voter. This is a first-class citizen. And believe me, it makes you a first-class citizen. Some of these numbers are a little out of date now, but I think there are roughly 235 million people who are of voting age in the United States. 222 million are actually eligible, eligible to vote, because lots of states don't let convicted felons vote. Uh, about 180 million are registered to vote. I think 129 million voted in 2012 in the presidential. 83 million voted in the 2014 midterms. If you're up here, you mean nothing. You mean nothing to policymakers. Again, like, we don't expect Starbucks to care about you if you don't drink coffee. Why would politicians care about someone who doesn't vote? But even if your preferred candidate doesn't win, simply by voting, you become part of, unfortunately, a very small select group that politicians do care about. And you do drive policy. And so there are tons of ways, tons of very important ways that people who care about the environment express themselves. And I don't want you to stop doing that. Riding your bike, recycling, changing your eating habits, your purchasing habits, your energy consumption habits. They are all extraordinarily impactful and important. But dear God, like vote. It is so easy. It is so easy. It takes the average person 20 minutes to vote. 20 minutes. And again, no matter who wins your election, you then become part of this really small group it drives policy. And it really does drive policy because politics is a marketplace. No one talks about it as a marketplace, but it really is. The people who produce the product, policymakers making laws, spend all their time measuring the marketplace to see what people want. Gosh, 47 days before election day? I mean, there are probably 500 polls in the field right now as I'm speaking. And when they find out what voters want, they fall over themselves to deliver it to them. But they only care about what voters want. And man, I mean, if 15.7, if even a small portion of these people started to vote, I mean, imagine waking up tomorrow and the front page of the New York Times said, 
in the upcoming presidential election, climate change is voters' number two priority. That would change everything. Everything. So, this is one like little plug I'll give for my nonprofit. If you want to promise to be a consistent voter, we will, free of charge, remind you of every single election. Every single one. You can go online there and sign a pledge. You can also sign a paper copy and just leave it here if you want. We will remind you to vote in every election. City council elections. School committee elections. Because your vote is so, so powerful. Um, so, that is it. I, there isn't much time for q and I'm going to stay late as well, but there, we do at least have six or seven minutes for question and answers. Thank you all. Thank you so, so much. You. you can just leave these on your table if, you do, if you're interested. Yeah. People want to yeah. grab one. Thank you so much. You're uh, welcome. I'm you're sure welcome. you didn't have a lot of questions because my mind is just going crazy, but I, I, I let the students go first. Do you have a question? Hi, I'm wondering um, if you've looked at other factors for people not turning off of voting. Because I remember like when I used to live in Malden and then our buildings got sold mm -hmm. and more than 90% of the people actually got kicked out of the house mm -hmm. and maybe about 200 out of those people moved out of Malden. They were all registered voters. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that was like maybe a month or so before, um, you know, one of the major town votings. And that wasn't something that I, I thought about, even though I was working on different campaigns. Right. So, I, I mean, do you have anything? I and mean, I know like Boston, for example, is a transit town with a lot of students and stuff like that. Like, are there other factors like that that are, you know, uh, encountering or that are factored into your poll analysis? Uh, yeah, so in case, she was asking about factors that contribute to people not voting and whether we've done any research on them and things like that. Uh, the first thing is we don't need to do any research on who votes or not because, again, that's public information and we just look at the voter file and see whether someone voted or not. As far as what contributes to someone not voting, yeah, sometimes there is <laughs> very unfortunate, but uh, easy to discover reasons for someone not voting, like laws that make it more difficult to vote, or people being kicked out of buildings, or moving, or being transient. Uh, so that's the easy answer to your question. The far more nuanced, and unfortunately not as, uh, uh, not as uh, compelling answer to your question, is beyond really easy stuff like that, not only do we not know why environmentalists or why anybody doesn't vote, we probably never will be. We'll probably never be able to figure out why a lot of people don't vote. And I'll get into why. The good, re good news is we found these workarounds, right? We found these things to do to make, someone not, to make someone vote. But the reason it's hard to figure out why someone doesn't vote is, and any social scientist will tell you this, I'm not a social scientist, hopefully social scientists will tell you this, it's easy to set up experiments to measure, oh, okay, if you apply this message, what type of responses do you get? How do you get someone to take a particular action? That's pretty easy to measure. What's really hard to measure is why someone does not take a particular action. It's really, really hard. The only way, the only way you can do it is to ask them, and you know what people do when you ask them about voting? They lie. They lie all the time. Very quickly, we did a, a big experiment right here, well, right close to here in Cambridge and Somerville, where we asked hundreds of environmentalists who never missed an election a bunch of questions about civic engagement and voting. Then we asked hundreds of environmentalists who literally have never voted about civic engagement and voting. The ones who have never voted, we said, hey, uh, when you don't vote, what are the reasons for not voting? The overwhelming majority of them said, oh, no, I, I always vote. And we know for a fact they didn't vote. We have their public voting records. 
Some of them are 60 years old and been registered for 40 years, and they had missed like hundreds of elections. We thought they might vote, so we actually had a backup question ready for those people. And we said, okay, okay, well, on the rare occasion that you don't vote, what is the reason you don't vote? A smaller majority, but still a majority, said, no, you don't get it. I always vote. And so that illustrates two things. One, it tells us beyond the, very, the, the simple but disturbing things that you mentioned, it's kind of hard to figure out why people don't vote because they lie about it. But the second thing that tells us is that even people who don't vote still buy into the societal norm that voting is a good thing. That's why all this social pressure works so much. All these people were lying to a volunteer that they will never see again because they wanted them to think that they're a good voter. It's how people want to express themselves. And so if you take advantage of that, as many campaigns and we are now doing, it's the most effective way to get someone to vote. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, oh wait, let's just wait for uh, the, because there are, there are people listening in to us. So, yeah. So you mentioned that you found tons of environmentalists who currently don't vote. Um, do you have, are you able to reach out to all of them or how does that work? Uh, is it difficult to have the capacity to do that? It's a great question. Uh, we are a very, very new nonprofit, although I've been using techniques like this for a few years in political campaigns. We only launched 11 months ago. Uh, we you know, need to raise money for every single bit of voter outreach we do and no. We, we last presidential election, so the 15.78 million number is for the last midterm election. The last presidential, 10.1 million environmentalists didn't vote. We're not going to be able to reach out to 10.1 million people. Uh, but we're hopefully going to be able to reach out to a lot of people. And uh, we're doing our best to grow and grow and grow. Uh, unfortunately, though, campaigns usually only target people who are either very likely to vote or somewhat likely to vote. So what we do know is no one else is going to be talking to these people because we have a long-term goal. Campaigns have a very short-term goal. If I tried to do this on a political campaign I was running, I'd be fired in a second. Campaigns don't talk to non-voters, nor should they. Um, so I was wondering, all, like the talk was about getting people out to vote, and I mean, I know this would be like a little underhanded, but do you know of any instances where people call like voters who they know aren't going to support them and say, oh, the turnout's going to be really low, you should go out and vote? <laughs> it's a great question. Did everybody hear that? Uh, it, does, does anybody call your opponent? Do any campaigns call their opponents supporters with messages that they know will reduce turnout? Uh, usually not, just because it's, you don't get a great return on your investment. It's not a good expenditure to make, but campaigns absolutely do find cheaper ways to try to depress turnout of people who will support their opponents. Like, yes, I hope you'll forgive me. I'm not going to go into particular examples because we are a nonpartisan nonprofit. Uh, <laughs> and, and, but yes, yes, political campaigns and political parties all the time try to suppress the vote among certain groups who will support their opponents. It happens all the time. That particular thing that you mentioned doesn't really happen just because it, it's expensive to, con to run a model, find your opponent's supporters, individually contact them, and honestly, there, there are cheaper ways to play tricks on your opponent. <laughs> than that one. <laughs> but that's a good question. It's a good question. Thank you. And come back next week. We're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to have an environmental history talk. We have author Charles Seaman, the author of 1491 and 1492, coming to speak to us.